Hi everybody. This is unannounced and I thought I would just pop onto my channel and say hello. And uh, I'm wondering how everybody is doing out there around the world. It's a really difficult time and I hope you'll just join me in this YouTube live and I'd like to do more of them. It's my way of checking in with you, uh, seeing how you're doing, uh, seeing how you're handling the pandemic. It's really an extraordinary time. At least in my lifetime, I've never seen anything like this. And uh, just, you know, really curious how everybody's doing. I have a couple of groups that I, I'm in contact with, but as far as on YouTube, I, I don't always get a chance to communicate with you. So I think the YouTube Live is a really great, great platform for that. You can ask me questions. I'm happy to answer them. In fact, what I did was I printed out quite a few questions from the past uh, that have been submitted, and I just never got around to answering them. So imagine that. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'd love to uh, hear from you if you happen to be here, um, happen to be listening in. I think that you can chat with me, which would be awesome. I'd love to hear your questions and just hear how you are doing. Um, now, YouTube Live is a little bit new for me, so um, forgive me if I'm a little challenged me, here. So, um, forgive me if I'm a little challenged <laughs> here. Hang on. Um, forgive me. Let's mute that first of all. So I'm, I'm actually listening on. Hi, Carrie. Um, nice that you have joined us. I think that you... Um, yeah, you're in the chat. So great. Um, Carrie, where are you from? Where are you um, located? Great. Hi, Valerie. <laughs> wow, it's great to see you here. Um, uh, so, Carrie, you're in Florida. Okay. And Bald uh, Dynamo. <laughs> okay, I see your comment there. Where are you located, uh, Bald Dynamo? Dynamo, where are, you, where are you located? And Valerie, why don't you uh, let us know where you're from? You're in the UK, right? That makes sense. Okay. Awesome. Well, this is uh, very impromptu. Yeah, Valerie, you're in California, of course. How are you doing in California? Because California is a state that's been hit pretty hard. Um, unfortunately, um, so what I've done here, everybody is, uh, I, I hope to, uh, do more of these YouTube lives and number one, can you guys hear me? Let, let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> I've had some troubles with audio here. So if you can hear me say, yes, I can hear you. If you can't hear me, then say, no, I can't hear you. I'd love your feedback at this point. Cause I can try to make improvements, but um, right now I do have a different microphone. So I'm hoping that um, you can hear me. So Valerie says, so far our community doesn't have many cases. Well, that's wonderful news. Okay, great. You can hear me well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, so what I hope to do once we get this figured out is like, number one, how do you do a live YouTube? And then number two, is the sound quality okay? I, as you know, I've done a couple of live um, YouTubes and I've had my wonderful assistant, assistant Joey with me. Um, he wrote me a really nice protocol for this and um, I got a new microphone. So it's plugged into my Surface Pro 6 and uh, yeah, great guys. It's it's so nice to like connect with my audience in YouTube because this is like the only way I can really ever get to know you. We don't have a Facebook group. And um, I know some of you are in my courses, which is awesome. I recognize some names. That's really fun. Um, so I'm going to just start telling you a little bit about, um, I guess, how things are uh, in my part of the world. I live in Hamilton, Montana. And um you know, things are quiet right now in our state. We don't have a lot of cases and our part of my, I have two sons and one of them is married. Well, they're both married and one of them lives in Salt Lake City and we just became grandparents. So that's been very exciting. Fortunately, um, our older son and his wife and our new granddaughter are living with us right now. And the reason for that is they left Salt Lake City because, um, they were a little bit concerned about the pandemic. And so we've actually had a really wonderful time with them. And 
So if you haven't seen me on my YouTube channel, the reason is that we have a new granddaughter. And I can't think of a better reason to um, take a little break from what I normally do. Um, we get to see Willa, that's her name, and I've been reading Dr. Seuss books to her. And um, she's only about two months old right now, but she uh, already has such a personality. And um, so hi, everybody. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for the congratulations. And thank you, um, Deborah from New York. Wow, it's great to thank you for being on this um, I was on. And, and I wonder about other artists around the world and other people around the world. And um, being in a state like Montana, where we have a, you know, this is called the big sky state because uh, it is a very big state with a very kind of, you know, low population. We're not as close together as you are in New York City or in California or in Atlanta, Georgia or Florida. So in some regards, you know, we're lucky, but I, I still feel like Montana will probably have their, the peak in the pandemic at a later time. Um, and so I hope all of you out there are staying super safe. And um, the most recent recommendation by, by the CDC and, and Anthony Fauci, and by the way, Anthony Fauci happens to be my husband's ultimate boss um, because my husband works in infectious diseases. So, um, and his, he works at the Rocky Mountain Lab in Hamilton, which is where I live. And the Rocky Mountain Lab is a National Institute of Technology. And so there are many people that work not directly with my husband, but in other labs that are working on the COVID-19 protein. Um, obviously, vaccines are work, being worked on around the world. And I feel fortunate that I, I can talk to my husband and say, you know, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? But I know there's a lot of stuff going around um, on the news and it's, it's very disheartening at times. And, and it, it's also like, there's a, a huge like amount of um, misinformation. Um, I think people do the best they can, but when it comes to this sort of thing, you, do, you, you really don't want to present anything but the facts. So let me just say that we're following the news very carefully. And um, for those of you who are tuning in um, from the U S uh, I, I do highly, uh, I, I agree with the idea that we should be ha wearing cloth masks. It's not something to be understated. It's actually very important and it can help us to reduce the number of cases in our country. So, and I know that people are tuning in from around the world and you know we've kind of seen what's been happening from around the world and you can kind of see that some, some countries are doing better than others. Well, um, Anyways, I don't want to, this is not totally about the pandemic, but I just wanted to like get a feeling for how you guys are doing. Hi, Rob. Okay, you're calling in or you're in here. You're uh, tuning in from Hamburg, Germany. Awesome. Um, Andy Smith. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why your screen is frozen. I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, thanks, Carrie, for saying that your screen is not frozen. Um, we've got somebody from Michigan, Vern Merlo. Um, I, I'm very, very happy to see you guys tuning in because if you like this and let me know if you do like these um, live uh, YouTube chats, that's all they are really. It's just my chance to get to know you if you like them. And if you like more of them, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions. I mean, that's my real purpose of being here is I want to answer questions. Uh, I, I feel like I've been um, absent from my YouTube channel. It, it's a strange time. I've been mostly at home and spending time with our granddaughter and not painting a whole lot. And I don't even know if my 2020 solo exhibition is going to happen in Idaho. Um, I'm hoping it will, but it may be a virtual thing. And uh, just like all of you, I feel this disruption in my life. It, even though I have a studio that's separate from my house and even though I can come here and it's safe, this is a time to be with your family if you can be with your family. I feel, you know, very fortunate that we can be with family. Not all of our family because my other son lives in Portland with his wife and we don't get to see them. But a lot of you are separate from your uh, separated from your grandchildren, from your family, from your your children, um hopefully not your spouses, but um I just want you to know that I I I wake up in the morning thinking about <laughs> um how what just what a trying time this is, and I hope you're doing well. 
And I, that's one reason why I've been kind of wanting to do a YouTube live so I can connect with you and see how you're really doing. Does anyone want to share anything via the chat? And yeah, that's public, but if you want to chat about how you're doing, um, so uh, Bald Dynamo says, uh, Pauline, how long have you been in lockdown? So yeah, there's conversation going on. Okay, watching from Northern Ireland, that's awesome. All right, I, I, I know we could talk about the pandemic um, for hours and hours, but that's not really why what I wanted to do here. I really wanted to say hi, um, let you know I'm thinking about you and would like to try and you know, if, if you guys have any ideas of content you'd like for to see on my channel, because I sort of feel like you're stuck at home and maybe you want to see something special that I haven't done before. And um, I'm thinking, you know, what can I do that might be kind of fun? Anyways, one thing I thought I would do right now is address some questions that you guys have been nice enough to uh, fill out uh, over the past year. You've sent questions to me and I've never had the chance to really answer them. So what I did today was I organized them in categories. So just so that you know, the core categories that I have your questions in right now are like if you work in acrylic or if you work in encaustic or let's say you work in cold wax medium or let's say you've got a question about supports like, you know, what types of paper, what type of boards or how do you um, how do you hang your stuff on the wall and things like that? How do you finish your work? So I've got a lot of categories here. And I, I, I realized so impromptu that I have no idea, like you guys are, perhaps you all like to do one kind of medium, I don't really know, but maybe I'm watching the chat right now, let me know with like a couple words, what medium you work in and what you're mostly interested in, because that'll help me to know what kind of questions to talk about right now. So if it's acrylic, if it's cold wax medium, or if it has to do with technique, um, process. I actually have, I'd say the majority of questions that people have submitted are in the uh, process technique sort of um, category. And that's not really media specific. That's almost like any medium. So that's kind of what I, I thought I could talk about if that was good for you. And um, let's see, Carrie says, what can I, where can I find videos of Clarify Stage? I am doing your course, but I'm stuck. Okay, got it. Yeah, in fact, I also have a printout of all the videos I've done on YouTube right now. I hope that they're, you know, in order here. But I, I tried to also go in there, Carrie, and number my videos so you can find them uh, more easily. And regarding finishing a painting... You might look at video number 29, look at video number 33. Um, those were two videos where I actually showed the process of finishing. Video 74 is another one where I finished a painting. Um, that would just be on the YouTube channel, but if you're in my course, um, Carrie, are you in the Powerful Design and Personal Color? I think you are, right? <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, this is a painting that I hope to be in my, uh, my 2020 show. And I, I, I like to switch things around. But um, anyways, let me just uh, respond to Carrie here. So Carrie, if you're looking for examples of me finishing work, um, I do do that in PDPC, as you know, for 16 paintings that are done in oil and cold wax medium. That's one place where you're going to see me finishing work and talking about those final stages. But um, in addition to the videos here on YouTube, which are... Again, I tried to number them, and those ones are, again, number 29, number 33, and number 74. In various mediums, I talk about how I finish work. Um, it's a very, you know, just in general, it's a very different um, mindset, I think, when you're finishing work. And for those of you who've worked with me in my courses, you know that the way that my mind, the way I like to think about the painting process is that there's a time to think and there's a time not to think. I think through my YouTube channel, if there's anything I try to impress upon you is that when we get stuck, it's usually because we're thinking at the wrong time. And it's not that we need to um, think of painting as like, no, you never need to think. That would not be true. 
a lot of us, including myself, you know, I've been, I was self-taught for a long, long time when it, when it comes to painting. And I would have to say that I relied on my intuition for, for much of that time until I started to learn a little bit more about, you know, the types of things that, that you want to say in your work. But even after going to grad school and getting an MFA, um, that didn't really solve all of my problems when it came to painting. I think what I realized was that, you know, the best way for us to want to get into our studio and never quit, um, to stay motivated and to be productive and to obviously the more that you paint, the more time that you paint, doesn't matter what medium it is, doesn't matter what genre it is, the more time you can spend painting, um, just that process alone is going to move your art forward. So what can we do to make sure that we go in our studio and we don't feel intimidated, we don't feel overwhelmed, and we don't continually get stuck? And um, for those of you who are in my courses, um, you know very well that I talk about the play stage. And I try to show this on YouTube. I mean, you've seen me. Um, there's nothing... Uh, uh, in my early stages that you can identify that that there's a lot of thought. I'm trying to be as playful as possible. And that's where the word ugly comes in. So I'm a, a very big promoter of the word ugly because once you can accept that your art will be ugly when you don't think and when you, you know, focus on playing, um, if you can just be okay with that and realize that it's just a temporary phase of your painting, it's not meant to stay ugly. Nobody wants to finish their work and, and, and for it to, to remain ugly forever. Uh, the way to move our work forward then is to at least get our foot in the door, get our paints out and our brushes wet and get something on the wall so that we can, or on a table so we can start painting. And then, um, you know, uh, throw something down there because the worst thing is looking at a blank, a blank canvas, a blank, blank sheet of paper or a blank panel, something really intimidating about that. And so um, to overcome that, just put anything down. It doesn't even matter what it is. It can be, it can be paint. It can be dry mark making tools. It can be collage material. Um, the minute that you start to cover up that white surface, you're going to see that, um, it's less intimidating. And I call that the play stage because it doesn't really matter what you start out with. And I realize that some of you out there want to paint, you know, with different mediums. You want to paint maybe realistic work, or maybe you want to paint totally non-objective work, which is what I do. But regardless of that, a little bit of play and, and play doesn't only refer to putting paint or materials down on a canvas or a piece of paper. It can also be your thought process. You know, sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I have the most creative thoughts. Maybe it's because I've just had a good night's rest and I wake up thinking about either a painting that's in progress or a painting that I might want to start. Your thought process can be part of the play stage. And it's, it's always handy to have like a sketchbook or a journal or something that where you can jot down notes because you never know when inspiration may hit you. And then you get to the studio and if you didn't write those things down, you might forget. It's like, what was I thinking of first thing in the morning or last thing at night before I went to sleep or when I was taking a hot shower? Like, what was I thinking about? So, um, yeah, I just highly recommend having a place to write these things down uh, so that when you're ever feeling like you don't know where to get started, you know, look at your notes. So I, I thought I would just um, it's kind of hard for me to <laughs> read all your comments while I'm actually talking. and. And all that. So I thought I would just address some of your questions. And um, again, if you guys like this format of um, live YouTube, then I'm more than happy to answer questions. I will have a link in the description box of where you can um, submit more questions because right now when we're all stuck at home, I think that the one thing I can do is try and answer your questions. And so I'm going to hop over to the section that's on um, basically process because I'm, I'm a very big promoter of process way more than I am of any one particular medium. Um, I myself have worked in so many different mediums and hopped from one to the other. I don't know if you guys have done that, um, but if, if you have, I'm kind of curious about why you've hopped from one medium to another. If it's like, like from watercolor to acrylic to collage to 
printmaking to <laughs> I've done ceramics and photography. I mean, you name it, I've done it. Um, I kind of hit that frustration level. And um, a lot of that had to do with like lack of understanding of um, not just what I wanted to say, but how do I make my work really strong? And so that's one reason why the information that I provide in my online courses now is to address that part of really getting stuck and not knowing what to do. Um, I feel like this information when I was young, I wish I'd had it when I was a teenager. I probably would have majored in art, but um, art school at that time wasn't what it is today. Um, so anyways, yeah, I tend to ramble. If This is what happens when there's a one-way conversation and I can't hear what you guys are saying. All right, so I have a question from Valerie Payne who happens to be uh, in the chat right now. Um, so she wrote a question, when you work on a large scale painting on paper and things are just not working for you, do you keep on working or crop the piece down or even use it for collage pieces? Well, certainly in the past, Valerie, I have done that. I used to be like, you know, you could have called me the mad cropper. Um, I remember when I was first doing watercolor, it was always like, well, you know, I, I think I got the play stage done even then, but there's always like this rush to try and like say, um, this little section here is working great. I'm going to crop it, frame it, you know, whatever, show it. And any of us can crop work. But right now I'm, I'm, I'm almost like anti-crop. I've done a 180 degree turn here in terms of like, what is cropping exactly and why wouldn't I want to do it? I mean, I think any of us can crop work. And what we're doing when we crop work is that is our intuition saying, hmm, if I get rid of the right side, if I get rid of some of the top, if I get rid of this little area down here, wow, look at how great my painting is. But unfortunately, that does not, that's kind of like a short fix. That's like quick and easy, down and dirty. Um, what is happening is, yes, you are using your intuition and your sense of design and your aesthetic to find a strong area within your painting. You know, you crop it, maybe you're cutting a canvas, you're cutting paper, you put a frame on it, looks great, you know, great. But, but actually, you've just ripped yourself off of the biggest challenge that was in front of you. And the biggest challenge in front of you was to finish your, your piece without cropping. That's much harder. We all know it together and you can make them any size you want to crop on top of watercolor paper or anything. Get out your pair of scissors and, you know, press till you've got a great painting. But um, anyways, in answer to your question, I don't do that anymore. I try not to do that anymore. And I don't know, that probably started about 10, 15 years ago. I think for me, I'd much rather look at something and struggle. Um, I almost like try to put myself in the position where I want to struggle because um, something that isn't working is a painting saying to you, I dare you to like quit. I dare you to put me away and not look at me because I'm not working. And for me, it's like, okay, I accept the challenge. Um, the only way though that I can have that attitude of like, I know I can, I, I really do have the attitude. I can finish any painting. I don't care how ugly it is. I don't care how badly things are going. I don't care how many layers of paint there are. Um, <clears throat> no matter what the problem is, like it, it all comes down to how well do you understand what your problem is? And then how well do you, how full is your toolbox so that you can address any problem your painting throws at you? Because once you know those things, there is really nothing you can't solve anymore. It doesn't mean it's gonna go fast and it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It just means you have the confidence to keep going. And so I think that that's a really important thing. And I highly, highly encourage um, anybody who's out there who, who really is serious about their art to try and um, fill your toolbox, um, understand the foundations of color and design, which is what my online course is about. Um, I've had, I, I now have over 600 people who've taken the course and um, I constantly ask for feedback and, you know, is there anything I can do to improve the course? And um, to be honest with you, I have more people asking me, how do I log in and how do I, um, how do I find the website maybe? But the, the challenges of my course are not 
about the course itself, I think that it's pretty straightforward. So anyways, um, that's how I'm able to have enough confidence, I guess, in my own like skill set to um, be able to um, finish work. Okay, so that's a great question, Valerie. Thank you. Um, I had another great question from Cora in France, and this is a while ago she wrote, but here she wrote um, some advice to get um, to get rid of that person sitting on my shoulder telling me your work is no good. Um, do you have a magic way of making them disappear? Um, I wonder how many people out there, just if you want to put in the chat window, like, do you ever have that voice that's super negative in your, like, sitting on your shoulder? You can literally almost feel it whispering into your ear, or maybe it's like, it's a very hard thing to overcome. It was really hard for me because I definitely had, I know, I know what Cora is talking about. Um, it's, it's a voice in your head that says, you know, Hang it up, hang it up, put your brushes away, stop painting. Um, you shouldn't be a painter, you shouldn't be an artist. Who do you think you are? I mean, that's really not looking good. What what is this? Um, almost yeah, yeah, I see that. And um, thanks, you guys. So yes, I do have I used to have, I'd say that very negative voice in my head. And part of that comes from the fact that, you know, a lot of us um we have a preconceived idea of what we think is good what we think is beautiful. And when it's not that we feel really discouraged and we're really vulnerable to that love, the, that, that thing that the voice is what I call the left side of the brain. Um, so the way to overcome it literally um, gets so exasperated by what it sees that it's like, uh, it almost can't deal with it. And it's so not what the left brain wants because the left brain, so you know, like the left side of your brain is analytical, it's verbal, um, it's logical. Um, it has a sense of what beauty is and what ugly is. And it's just right there to tell you what you're doing on the right side of the brain, which is creative and um, intuitive and expressive and, and emotional. All those things are what you're trying to um, encourage when you play. And so when you play um, and you, you kind of just don't worry about results, the left brain becomes disinterested. Um, it, it gets bored and it starts to be like, I'm out of here because I don't know what you're doing. I'm just, I'm going to go sit on the side here. I go take a nap. And while that's happening, your right brain's like having a great time. So that's my solution for shutting down that negative um, thing that happens when we um, when things aren't going terribly well and then you know it's important to realize though that you know you're not going to really get a great result uh, when you play because that's kind of the point you you're putting yourself into the the child mode you're only two you're only three you're playing with colors um, you didn't care when you were two or three what you did and that's what actually as adults it's really hard for us to do that but if we can do that um, that's really great and so um, that's what I do in the play stage. And then I move on to this middle stage where I feel like my paintings, um, grow up just the way I did. Um, to me, that's a really, even if it's only a mental thing, you're thinking about the fact that your artwork can live the same life, life that you have lived. If you've lived, um, um, a, a life that has had a lot of ups and downs, your work can actually show that. Or if, you know, um, various you have certain things you love that you uh keep coming back to whether they're the colors um certain colors or maybe your environment um that part of your life can deeply impact your work so if you want to know how your work can stand up from everybody else's i think the key to that is um yeah go ahead and play but then when you get a, you know your painting advances just keep in mind that your painting can reflect your own life and when it reflects your own life and not somebody else's that's what makes it unique and that's what's going to make your work stand out from everybody else's and um, it'll just happen you just have to kind of trust that it will happen um, just I think that's the main thing there so that's a good question Cora and then Nancy McMorrow from Nashville Tennessee wrote I've worked through the PDPC online workshop with acrylic paint. My question is how to maintain some of the ugly with layering. I play and explore and realize I don't like so much the mid-tones and darks and shapes. I end up adding more light 
which covers most of what I initially did at first. How do I not cover up what I don't like? What am I missing? The process builds and builds and I think I'm missing something. I know ugly is good. I just end up covering it with something that I like better, but how do I let the depth, depth shine through? Um, so that's a good question for those of us who like layering and history and um, that concealing and revealing of things that are deep down. And I'm, I'm always saying that, you know, uh, the reason why ugly is good in my opinion is because um, in these later stages, if, if you want something that is like, you know that ugly is not what you want, and then you discover what it is you do want, a little bit of that ugly showing through, like percolating through all those layers, is gonna make the part you do love that much stronger. So if you don't have something that's partially ugly somewhere in your painting, like how are you gonna know, how, how do you see the contrast between what you love versus what you don't love? And so um, I think in answer to your question, Nancy, um, there are many ways to reveal things that are deep down in our painting. So if you think of a painting in terms of like layers of sedimentation, you know, you know that um, perhaps those ugliest layers are on the bottom and then you kept working from the bottom up and you've got say 10 layers. Um, scraping, gouging, sanding are some of my favorite ways, um, almost regardless of whether it's cold wax medium, acrylic, watercolor is a little different. You know, you've got transparent layers, you're probably using a sponge uh, to, lift these delicate layers. So it does matter what medium you're working on. If it's encaustic, you're using like a um, a razor blade. Uh, you're using a ceramic tool to pull back on these hardened layers of wax. So the medium, yeah, there's a bit of technical information you need to know, but basically um, you're going to need to excavate down to these lower layers if you wanna get down to ugly or, um, Hopefully, if you've played enough, you're going to know pretty well how to get ugly at the drop of a hat. I could I could have a painting that's almost done and say to myself, um, I need some ugly here. And you, everyone out there has their own idea of what ugly is, whether it's muddy color, maybe it's too much texture, maybe it's shapes, shapes that are not very clear and they're kind of like, you know, what is that? Um, I don't know, maybe it's lack of overlapping. You know, you guys each are going to have your own definition of what is ugly. But if you have spent enough time in the play stage, you're going to know how to get that back and you can bring it back at any time. So my answer to Nancy would be that if you've lost it, if you've covered it up because you put too much paint on top, either excavate or bring it in at the end. Um, it does kind of mean that you're willing to have some courage to go back into that play stage, which is where ugly kind of um, is featured, I'd say that, you know, you're going to get more ugly in the play stage than any other stage um, because you're not thinking. So if you can kind of like turn that left brain off when you need to go back to ugly, that it's kind of like a switch. And, and the more you paint, the more you can do that. You just turn off a switch, go back to the ugly stage, do it. I've closed my eyes sometimes when, um, in, in fact, the painting behind me, I think the last thing I did, um, it's, it's mostly it actually it started as a black and white painting and then I wanted to add some color so I put some indigo blue in it but the very last thing I did was like this this orange mark here or there's probably an orange um, there's some orange line that I, I literally did not look at my painting when I walked across it I, I held my neo color to crayon against these two panels and I literally looked away from the painting and I walked and I just like put the mark um, on the board so it, it like closed my eyes. <laughs> um, okay, so that was Nancy's question. That was a really good question. And let's see here, another technical question. Okay, Ann Spohr from Cincinnati, Ohio asked, I'm a novice, perhaps predict predictably, my colors become muddy. How do I avoid this? And how do you know how much quiet negative space and where to put it or leave it. So that's kind of a lot of questions. And, and um, as far as muddy goes, um, that has to do with color. And I'm, I'm currently doing like a lot of experiments with color. So the definition of mud for like the simple answer to the, the question of what is mud and like, why are you getting it? Um, if you look at any basic color wheel that you've seen since kindergarten, 
um, you know, the typical color wheel, if you break it down to the primary colors and the secondary colors, you're only talking about six colors. But if you ever have the primaries in, in one painting, like in one mixture of paint, like let's say the blue, the yellow, and the red. If all three of those are present in any color combination, you're gonna get what you would call mud. It, it tends to be army green. It's just the way it is. Um, so whether, you know, if you look at the color purple, purple has red and blue in it. And then if you mix purple with yellow, um, that's gonna give you mud because it has the presence of all three primaries. In addition to that, you've just uh, mixed two complements. So the reason complementary colors create a desaturated um, kind of a muddy mess is because they're opposite on the color wheel and colors opposite on the color wheel um, tend to give you that desaturation. We tend to call it mud, but mud can actually be quite an asset if we know how to use it. So if you love color, then mud should actually be your friend. Um, it's, it's really just, a, it's funny because Almost any negative thing you can think of from getting stuck in art to creating mud to like nothing's working and I want to crop my painting. All of these things that that trip us up have a solution. We just have to understand what it is. And I will say it again. And I say this all the time that if you're an artist out there, you've worked hard to get where you are. Um, you have like so much knowledge of what you've collected over the years and you can take any one facet of what you've learned, whether it's about color, technique, your materials, the type of paper you use, you know, what you're mounting your, your paper on or um, the type of art making tools that you use. And you could break any one of those down and it becomes its own science. So um, I really think it's important that we as artists study it's because they're not challenging themselves. And I think that's a huge trap. So if you're out there and you're, you're feeling challenged and you're feeling stuck, that's actually way better than like, oh, another success. That's great. But I would much rather be stuck than have success. I don't really, I don't think success is what I'm striving for. I think that I will have success if I learn how to get myself into a lot of um, dire situations that require I be like this amazing problem solver, which I'd much rather say, yeah, I'm an amazing problem solver. And that has led me to become successful rather than, oh, well, yeah, art is easy and I can I can create a successful painting anytime. I, I would much rather be the great problem solver. So um, I'm just gonna see if any of you have questions now. Let's see. Okay, so Valerie asked, um, you have to run, right? You, you wanna know and I'll do another live, another live again. And um, I see a lot of questions here. So um, that's a good question. I don't, you know, it's not like I can um, email all you guys who are on YouTube. Um, let's just say that I did this call at, what time is it my time? Around 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. So we had daylight savings time and you guys know that you can Google online, find what time zone um, depending on the time zone you're in, what time it is in your part of the world when it's 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time um, here in Montana. So today is Monday. And um, maybe what I'll try and do is on Mondays and um, Thursdays, I will try to, to be here at 3 p.m. Um, Mountain Daylight Time. And again, after this live is over with, which I'm going to end pretty soon, um, there's going to be a link in this little description box. Sometimes you just have to like um, look right below this video and it'll have a dot, dot, dot where it says more. And then you can like look for um, a place where you can submit questions. Or I will just say that my next YouTube live is going to be on Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Today is the um, 6th. So that's the 7th, 8th, 9th. So um, the next one will be on the 9th. And I will look forward to getting questions from you. And if I don't get questions from you, then what I will do is I have, again, I've got this whole handout of all the questions that have been submitted to me. I printed this out today. It's like 10 pages long. I don't have a shortage of questions. But if, if you guys don't have new questions for me, I'm just going to continue answering them. And um, I will just say that I do have a new library um, of videos that 
has all kinds of video tutorials and, and content, you know, critiques. And I'm going to be doing a new Q&A section, but that's going to be more for people who are in that library. I have all these different groupings of questions, and I, um, um, I want to be as helpful as I can. I think there's some overlapping questions. So when I kind of compile my list here of questions, I put them in categories, and I try to, like, if I have duplications, I will make them into one. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks again for everybody being here. I don't want to take your entire Monday, but it is Monday, and I, I just want to say that I, I think about you. Um, thank you so much for subscribing to my channel and for being here. It makes me feel like I'm not alone, and, and I hope you feel like you're not alone. I think we can all be together in this very, very um, trying and difficult time. We need to, to feel the sense of community and stick together with people who are like-minded. And I feel that all of you on my channel, I've always felt like we were very like-minded and, and I thank you for that. Um, I Like I said, I started this YouTube thing about a year ago, probably about a year and a half ago now, I don't even know, but um, I had no idea it would lead to a community, a sense of community. And so I thank all of you for being here and for encouraging me to, um, I think it's, it's, it's caused me to try and be a better artist, um, to be a better communicator and to try and give information that is something that you're interested in. So that's why your questions are really important to me. And I, even if I don't get to them, just know that I wish I could, I wish I could clone myself. Um, but again, I'm going to put the link where you can submit new, brand new questions. That's fine um, at any time. Um, but also my my website, artandsuccess.com. There's all kinds of stuff there. There's like free stuff and other stuff like courses and, and things like that. So anyways, I hope that you guys will have a nice evening. And i um, very excited that you're here. I look forward to next time. I will see you on Thursday then. Um, it will be April 9th. And it'll be 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Just go ahead and Google, say, what time is it in, say, Norway when it's 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time? And it'll shoot you what time it'll be in your part of the world. So thanks, everybody, and I wish you well. Bye now.